Warning, this is just a teaser. The full episode is behind a dystopian neoliberal paywall, available at patreon.com slash seriously wrong. But keep listening, because this is a great teaser. We had Brett from Revolutionary Left Radio on to brainstorm about revolutions. He did sketches with us. It was a blast. Here's some good parts from the episode. In the utopian justice system, the people are represented by two separate but equally important groups. The People's Defense Forces, who investigate crime, and the People's District Attorneys, who represent the transcendent, immortal idea of justice. These are their stories. All rise. Brett O'Shea, approach the stand. Hello. Now, it's no secret to the courtroom that you've been an influential member of the utopian cadre that's helped build the libertarian, socialist, democratic, confederalist, library socialism revolution. It brings the People's Tribunal no joy to try you for your crimes. Oh, God, what? You are accused of not spitting when the Soviet Union... (laughs) is mentioned well it it was a hot day and i didn't have a lot of water in my system you guys gave me free mountain dew but that's not really conducive to spitting in any case i defend the soviet union but go on you didn't spit mr o'shea again i'm parched i still won't spit but i'm just saying i don't have any spit also bailiff bring the defendant some water give him the opportunity to not spit okay this is a huge glass of water but i will drink it in front of the court Additionally, Mr. O'Shea, you are accused of denying the existence of authoritarianism. Yeah, I mean, I don't think necessarily that authoritarianism is a helpful heretic device by which to understand past proletarian movements, if that's your question. When you were doing your monthly check-in for your ideological position, you failed to check off the box which asserts that you are against stifling bureaucracy. My pen actually just genuinely ran out of ink, and I didn't mean to not check that box. I mean, even as a Marxist-Leninist, I would have checked that box. It was a pen issue at the end of the day. A likely story. Well, it's true. I think the court decides what's true. Next to the stand, I want to call a former comrade and colleague of yours. Aaron Moritz, please. That sack of shit. God damn it. First, I just want to say that I do recognize all the hard work Brett put into the revolution. But we always knew we'd have to deal with these sectarian struggles at some point. (sighs) Yes, I've seen him not spit many times wow fucking traitor order order no i'm not doing this because it's something that i want to do i like brett i always liked brett he was my best friend i wouldn't say that but there's a higher calling than just sticking up for your friends there's something called virtue and i don't want to live in a society where people are afraid to speak their mind openly I don't want to live in a society where, you know, friends are turning on one another and forming show trials, revolutionary tribunals. I don't want to live in a world that's a bureaucratic nightmare. Nobody who cares about people wants that. And that is why we all always spit when anyone says the word Soviet Union. How do you feel about the Soviet Union now that you are uh, have enough water in your mouth? I am hydrated, but I still think that the Soviet Union, given its flaws and its excesses and errors, was still ultimately a unprecedented show of proletarian power, and as such, I just won't spit when I hear the name. Well, it's clear, Mr. O'Shea, that you're an unrepentant authoritarian who is in favor of stifling bureaucracy. I don't think anyone here will deny that. I deny that. Before you're inevitably found guilty of these particularly heinous crimes, we want to be fair to you and give you the opportunity to self-crit to reduce your sentence. Okay, then one thing that I am very critical about is Aaron. I thought that we were close comrades. We fought side by side in the Great War. Uh, We've killed numerous fascists together. I invited him into my bedroom, you know, (laughs) thinking that we'd all have a good time together. And this is how it's repaid to me. So yeah, I'm going to be critical of my previous friendship choices. But beyond that, I have nothing to apologize for. Wow. Shut the fuck up, Aaron. I think that Aaron's going to be spending a lot of time with your wife where you're going. As a judge, my job is often really difficult. But fortunately, this one's really easy. He's guilty and will be sentenced to a minimum of 10 years in the luxury rehabilitation gulag with an option to re-up if he's unrepentant. Goddamn libertarian authoritarians. Three months later, Brett O'Shea is writing a letter to his wife from prison. Dearest wife, everything on my end is well. 
I could not be treated better by my captors. I get three meals a day, all of them vegan and extremely healthy. I have exercise routines and self-actualization therapy in the evenings. I'm starting to understand myself on whole new levels. In any case, I'm still pissed about being locked up. I was and still remain correct to this very day. I wish these libertarian authoritarians would understand that. And honestly, what's up with the spitting thing? I've never been a fan of, of spitting in the first place. I've always sort of found it off-putting and gross. Yes, it is libertarian and collectivist spit, but at the end of the day, it's still spit. And I just don't like it. I've never liked it. Send Aaron and the kids my best regards. Hopefully I'll see you all very soon. I have to get back to my Casper mattress and HDTV in my cell. Talk to you later. Mr. O'Shea, it's time for your mandatory daily second massage at 11.30 a.m. I've already had a massage today. I had three massages yesterday. I'm so loose, I could snap a tiger's neck in half. I don't want to go have another massage session. Sorry, Mr. O'Shea. We want to make sure that our prisoners' muscles are supple and relaxed so they can come to correct conclusions. You can come feel me. Feel how supple I am. All right, let's have a gander here. Uh, mm, mm. Oh, I don't know. Feel, you feel a little tense. It feels ah. like you've still got a little bit of stress deep down. Do you have down. something in your pocket? Ow. I'm not going to ask you again. It's time for the mandatory massage. But if you're good, at the end of the massage, there will be cheesecake. It's one of the guards' birthday. You are wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. This is kind of a jokey idea, but it struck me like, you know how social democratic footholds or social democratic reforms it'll be criticized from the left sometimes as placating the proletariat and making the real uprooting of capitalist society less likely because there needs to be that sort of tension. The contradictions of capitalism need to be made more forceful. And all of this stuff is kind of propping up capitalism by throwing the proletarian scraps and c keeping them placated. Mm -hmm. I got health care, so I don't want revolution. <laughs> right. Yeah. And if we have this idea that people can be placated by making sure they have health care and food, just like giving them a decent life. Maybe instead of liquidating the bourgeoisie, we can just placate them with nice things <laughs> during the revolution. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, they won't want to fight back. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, so I know that's that's partially tongue in cheek, but you're partially getting at, you know, what I think makes you guys so wonderful. And I think I share it is like, empathy and we're not violent people like never in my life or your guys' life are we going out shoulder bumping people in the street or trying to fist fight motherfuckers or, or kill our enemies you know we don't like <laughs> violence yeah. it's not something that we particularly excited to take part in and as far as it can be mitigated and pushed to the side we should absolutely take every single step we can and again the Marxist idea that the capitalist you, you can't just chalk it up to being bad people right that's that's sort of liberal idealism where you're saying you know it's it's the individual's fault for these broader structures at play that are sort of buffeting. They're just operating within a system as best they can. Some are evil assholes and some are just people trying to do their best for their family in whatever context they're given. We should absolutely take as many steps as possible to address that and realize that and give people an opportunity to come over and see how things could be different. In fact, in Cuba, as they were doing their revolution, all this land and like all these resources were owned by the West because the Batista regime was a U.S. puppet dictatorship that funneled wealth northward to the U.S. And so what Fidel and Che were trying to do is like, hey, America, we'll actually pay above market value for this land, right? We have to do it in bonds because our treasury was ransacked after Batista and his regime fled. They emptied the, the treasury. We don't have any money on hand right now, but we will absolutely, through a bond program, pay for this land back. That was way restrained. That was so generous of the Cuban people. They did not have to do it. This is a revolution. Take the land and point a gun in their face and say, fuck off. But no, they were still trying to be conciliatory. And in fact, Fidel says, I wasn't a Marxist Leninist at first, right? I just wanted a better world for Cuba. But once I came up against the realities of capitalism, once I saw just how obstinate and disgusting U.S. imperialism and capitalism were, I realized that I had to be pushed in this direction. They said no to those offers. They said, fuck no. We're not giving you any inch of ground. We're not working with you whatsoever. We're going to choke your economy. We're going to destroy your people. And the first chance we get, we're going to kill you, Fidel. We're going to invade your country and we're going to replant a U.S. puppet dictator. In that context, what in the fuck could Fidel possibly do? They were forced into this position to be like, okay, assholes, fuck you and let's go. And, you know, so I think that gestures toward this strain in Marxist history where there has been an attempt to be conciliatory, even way more generous and forgiving than they should have been 
and still it was met with the most disgusting and repulsive obstinance on the part of U.S. imperialists and capitalists. And so we do ourselves a disservice if we paint too rosy of a picture about how this is going to go, but we also do ourselves a disservice if we fetishize violence and say we must slaughter every person who's ever been a landlord or a capitalist and not ever give them a chance to come over to our side, engage with our ideas, and maybe even be won over. Yeah, and actually just picking up on Aaron's idea about pacifying the bourgeoisie, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to get behind liquidating Group X as like a phrase... I find it deeply disturbing, and rightfully so, because it's a description of one of the most horrifying things mm-hmm. possible, it's mass murder. But I could maybe be convinced of like the need for, in certain circumstances, to like restrain and imprison and pacify them as mm-hmm. <laughs> as Aaron suggests like I'm a sort of I'm a sort of open to that and I, I don't want to be completely closed-minded but I just feel like we need to really evaluate all of our options when we're talking about the one true global revolution that brings about 10,000 years of world peace and abolishes patriarchy racism class relations the idea of hierarchy and creates a a library socialism based on the principle of usufruct that makes sure that everyone gets their irreducible minimum check. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) And I can imagine sort of like the critique is like, maybe you're not thinking about this seriously enough, or you're not seeing the severity of the situation. But I don't agree. I think that a really scientific perspective on it would say, like, how many options do we have open? What is our ethical priorities? How do we live according to those ethical priorities? And how do we live according to those ethical priorities while creating the outcome that we want? And have we exhausted exhausted every single option before we resort to this kind of thing. That's really, really important to me and in, in the way that I think about this stuff. And I guess that's like sort of one of the big questions is like the means and ends question is like, do the do the means justify the ends? What is acceptable to do in the process of securing the bag on behalf of the global proletariat? <laughs> <laughs> and I find myself absolutely convinced that there needs to be a unity between means and ends and that the risks of not doing that are too great. So, yeah, the means and ends question, I I think, is an absolutely important one. If we're building our movement in a way that replicates the brutality, the inequality, the patriarchy, the chauvinism of our broader society, we're not doing ourselves or our movement or anybody else any favors. And I think this is taken very seriously by pretty much everybody who's active on the left. If you're an organizer, whether you're an anarchist or Marxist-Leninist or democratic socialist, and I've been in circles and organizations with all three numerous, numerous times, got along very well, everybody is very concerned about this, right? The way that our organizations are held, like here in Nebraska Left Coalition, maybe the white males don't talk first, right? We we put the floor open, the women talk first, the people of color give their perspectives. Those sorts of prefigurative, if you will, approaches to our organizing, it's not only essential, but they've kind of sort of always been there, right? There's always been those tensions in our organizations and always attempts to make them better. I mean, The Black Panther Party, for example, had a huge problem with heteronormativity, machismo, and patriarchy. And within that movement in the 70s in the United States, for no less, there were movements by women members and some members like Fred Hampton pushing against that, fighting against that strain in their own organizing. So this is something that we absolutely cannot dispense with. I think the means and the ends should, as much as possible, become aligned. But I also do believe that we need to have a very sober, clear-minded, historically informed picture of what exactly a revolution means and the exact sort of situations that we're likely to be thrust into. And if we're not willing to defend our stuff, if we're not willing to protect one another by any means necessary, then I think we, we weaken our movement. We might not ever get to those ends. So, you know, maybe there needs to be some synthesis here as far as decrease all of this negative shit as much as we can, but on the other hand, be sober and clear-eyed about what it's going to take to actually build this better world, and it's definitely going to force us into confrontation with some people who, for my God, kill children. They don't care that thousands of people have to sleep in gutters every night. They're willing to bankrupt entire families to get cancer treatment. We're not dealing with people who are going to sit at the table with us and talk about ethics and morality. We're dealing with people that have been proven to be some of the most ruthless, depraved people, especially at the highest levels of capitalism and imperialism, really fucked up people. But again, I want to reiterate some level of prefigurative politics is important, but the prefigurative politics don't matter as much if we never get to the point that our prefiguration is aiming at, right? And so that needs to be taken in consideration as well. But absolutely, be as ethical in your organizing as possible. Root this this nasty shit out of not only our organizing, but our personal lives, right? I feel like I, I have a responsibility 
to cultivate within my own personal self an ethical, moral, nurturing, loving, generous personality so that I can sort of be a a representation of the sort of world that I want to have, right? You can't be a greedy asshole who wants to put everybody who disagrees with you up against the wall and build this world that's supposed to emancipate and liberate, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of people. That's at odds. And I think that that contradiction needs to be paid attention to and needs to be overcome. Well, and I got to say that warmth is something that I love about you, Brett. You make me believe in left unity when all left (laughs) unity seem to be lost. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Well, that's it for the chunk of the episode that's available on Facebook, YouTube, the mainstream, wherever you're listening this to. And now it is time for the totally normal part of everyone's day where they ask for money and it isn't weird and they just kind of feel normal about it. Because yeah, it's... let's just put on a little bit of smooth, relaxing music. Oh, and yeah. I mean, what's more normal than asking for money after doing a little dance for someone? That's I fundamental. Know. I do it every week. Uh, it's like breathing to me, and it feels just as natural. I can tell from your posture that you're really comfortable with this part. <laughs> I, it's like I take a breath in. I remind people to head to Patreon, six bucks a month, get all the bonus episodes, help us keep making the show. Uh, means so much to us. I take a breath out. It's just yeah, natural. I take a breath in. I'm like, there's a Discord server, private Facebook group. You can talk about the show, talk to other people who listen to the show get the whole back catalog of episodes including the revolution episodes series that's ongoing breathe out it's completely normal i don't feel weird about it another thing i don't feel weird about is making something i love and then withholding it from most of the people who want to get it that's something that i feel normal about and enjoy normal segment normal episode thanks for listening uh we'll be back with a non-donor only episode next week full length But hey, why don't you chip in six bucks a month if you can? It makes a huge, huge difference to us being able to do the show at the level that we do and with the frequency we do. (laughs) 